Good morning. My name is Eileen Bedrine. I'm the Chief Data Officer for the Department of the Air Force. And this morning I am joined by Mike, Captain Mike Kanan, the Director of Operations at the MIT AI Accelerator. Good morning, Mike. Thanks for joining us today. Good morning, ma'am. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm really excited to be here out of FIDIC and specifically to be having this conversation with you. Um, if we if we look at my office, the Chief Data Office, this year of FIDIC is all about data whether we're talking about JADC2 or any of the other big data initiatives across the Department of the Air Force, you can't do machine learning and artificial intelligence with great volumes of high quality data. And I know that you and your team at the MIT AI Accelerator are absolutely great team players in making that happen. So this morning, I would like to begin our conversation by saying, I like to consider that I have a pretty tr non-traditional leadership journey where I started in the Army as an enlisted person and today I'm the Chief Data Officer for the Department of the Air Force. I look at you, there are some commonalities between um, a non-traditional leadership journey. Could you share a little bit about how you got into AI and machine learning with the Department of the Air Force? Sure, and again, thank you for having me here. These are crucial conversations, and I hope we're having different conversations, and at least that much of the pandemic largely stays with us. When I think about my career in particular, and I think for those who also have shared similar journeys like yourself, there's a central theme to them, and it's this. It's teaming the ideas of the new with the techniques of the old. And since Einstein, we've all learned that time is relative. So what does old mean? As I look back at my career, it's that theme. So I think of my first assignment. It was at the National Air and Space Intelligence Center. This is 3,500 of the nation's most brilliant individuals doing crucial national security work. And we had a mission, it was a hyperspectral mission, so it was a drone operation that could see the world in a lot more color bands than you and I can naturally see. And there's some philosophical things we could pull back on. What is it that it saw? Or what is it that an organism sees that sees in more color bands? And just the three that you and I see every day. But we ran this mission and we had a number of individuals in the 9S100 career field uh, who are some of the most talented Air Force enlisted airmen that we possibly have, just absolutely you know, on another level. And I think of, to them, I was old at the time. And it was their ideas that made that mission that was called Aces High so successful. From there, I'd moved to Shaw Air Force Base and had the opportunity to be the Director of Target Development for Operation Inherent Resolve. And we had some other new ideas, like using data, like structuring it, like visualizing it. If we could see the data, then we believe that targeting would get better in time. And these were the first steps to AI machine learning back in 2015. It was profound to talk about the idea of visualization. And we talked about that and I was fortunate at the time, the ideas of the new teamed with General Dash Jameson, who recently retired, the techniques of the old. And we were very successful with that, largely because of those same airmen, again, that relatively I was old too. Uh, from there, fortunately enough, I was moved up to the Pentagon and then spent three and a half years there, um, alongside you, of course, working on things like Project Maven, and, and standing up the Air Force Artificial Intelligence cross-functional team. And it's experience, right? We're all products of our experiences. So what's most important is this idea that we work together and then provide people experiences in order to learn new things. And you know, rank or age doesn't always dictate experience, especially in this new world. Uh, so there's a lot of experience and it's always that story. It's always somebody was there to help cultivate you. We often say, bloom where you are planted, right? But for thousands of years, since the dawn of farming and society, we've also fertilized soil. So it's on us, it's our responsibility to not just say bloom where you're planted, but to cultivate experience on these new topics. And I think that's largely the theme for how I got here today. Thanks, Mike. I have also heard you use the word uh, innovators, 
innovation, innovators dilemma. And I think that that is another common thread that you and I share. So could you kind of uh, talk a little bit about what you mean when you talk about innovators di dilemma? <laughs> My favorite quote, I think it's apropos to all aspects of life. It's the limits of my language mean the limits of my world from 19th century philosopher Wittgenstein. Uh, also read his stuff, it's, it's incredible. Reading is important. Um, so when I think about that idea, the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. What does that mean for an innovator? An innovator, generally speaking, wants to do something, again, new or different but largely they run into roadblocks. Perhaps those are reasonable roadblocks, perhaps they're not reasonable roadblocks. But at a certain point in time for the innovator, we must also communicate with those in the proverbial bureaucracy. And bureaucracies exist for a reason. They're big, they exist as a system of government for accountability, and that's okay. But the idea that we can also speak the language on how to navigate the system itself, I think is crucially important. When I think of, uh, of, of innovation at its core and spending time over at the Pentagon or thinking about the Department of the Air Force, it's like a big engine and an engine has many moving parts. Perhaps for myself, I'm just a small flywheel somewhere out there on the big cog of the machine. But based on how you spin, based on how fast you spin, you might say, well, that turn belt up there moves a larger piece of the engine. And I think that the innovator has a responsibility to do this as well. We often throw up the slide of the acquisition chart, that the, the 200 bubble chart that says, this is how you do traditional uh, FAR part 15 or something. And people will rail against that system. They'll hold it up there and say, well, surely this is broken. The first question should be, well, surely do you know every aspect of how that system works? Because you can't hack the bureaucracy unless you understand the bureaucracy. No one in, nowhere in the world does anyone appreciate throwing malware into a system. And that's a hard dilemma because while there are new ideas, you don't wanna get mired in the one thing that you're trying to do better, and that's to change that said issue that you, that you might've had. But for the innovator, sometimes I think we have to take a step back and to ask ourselves, well, why isn't this new idea working? So that we're speaking a common language that we can move forward on together. And I think that's, that's, the, that's the linchpin of this future, is to make sure we speak common language with those who might be different enough from us in demographics, in age, in rank, whatever that is, as long as we're speaking the same language, things can get better. In that umbrella of innovation, one of the things that I believe that you have done extraordinarily well is you are constantly innovating yourself. And I think that is a really, um, critical piece as we move forward in today's Air Force. Could you talk a little bit about how you do that investment in yourself so that you can push yourself forward? Uh, it's another theme that, that we should have, um, both here today, yesterday in the past, moving forward in the future for our workforces. And it's, it's fitting that we would talk about it. It's this idea that learning is a lifetime sport. And I'm talking the whole continuum of learning, not just reading some online articles, which we should also do, but I mean dedicated learning, like with books and such. As I look back to seminal learning in my life, um, maybe those books are things such as if you give a mouse a cookie or where the wild things are, maybe good night moon. And trust me, I know I'm talking about children's books here, but I'm going somewhere. There are also books like Sagan's Cosmos, Hawking's universe in a nutshell, or being about 10 years old and reading Brian Greene's The Elegant Universe over and over again. And most recently, Harari Sapiens, perhaps. Their favorites like Tolstoy, Huxley, Virginia Woolf. And all of those books have something in common. People since the dawn of language, 
learning, and eventual writing have debated and discussed consciousness, theories of physics, biology, social realities, technologies, and all the rest of the things that constitute our human experience. And the average person hears about them. I mean, it's the human experience. We experience them every day. We know of the words, but not always what those words mean. Essentially, every topic, for the most part, has been brought to light. But for me, back to those good books, that's something that does more. It brings a topic to life. And in my mind, that's a little bit of a distinction with a difference. So I look back and I think of learning in any meaningful way, it's centered around a candid dialogue. Maybe that's with someone else. Maybe that's with yourself, the most important conversation. And for me, the concepts of consciousness, experience, social order, biology, frankly, the human story is best brought together in the story of AI. And again, many people bring the topics to light, but fewer to life. So I would say something pretty simple. It is something like read books, read the classics, read math, read science, read sci-fi, read fiction, read history, just please read more. And I think that is something we're missing out on the bite-sized chunks of where we're at currently. And when you think about investing in yourself, whether that's in leadership or whether that's in your personal lives and your family, other people have experienced those things too. So as an avid reader, I think that might be the catalyst for much of what um, I've been so fortunate to have so far, frankly. Um, but that's investing in yourself, reading. And for what it's worth, and this is reflected in the approach that the Air Force is taking with digital university and the work happening with quarantine university and everything else, back to the learning as a lifetime sport. We should view it as an obligation to provide contemporary te technology education, contemporary education on any topic. There's no reason that we shouldn't provide the opportunity to dial into Udemy or something similar and be able to learn about photography to make your life better or something to that effect. Um, and we're doing that in demonstrable ways. But one piece is the barriers to education have never been lower. If you'd like to learn something or redo your kitchen, go on YouTube. We can figure that stuff out. At a certain point in time, at an inflection point such as this, we have to take a step back and say, at where, where, where is my responsibility? Where is my learning responsibility? And um, books, books do that. Thanks, Mike. I, I, you know that I am all about lifelong learning. Uh, you know, and being a technical person, I love to log on and code. Um, but the reality is it's more than just coding. It's really the holistic approach that I think is really important because it's not just one thing, but you can do one thing a little bit every day, whether it's listening to a podcast on your commute to work um, it, or on your daily walk, or it can, that little bit of investment holistically can actually help you grow light light years and the reality is today's airmen they are digital learners and so it's important that we understand not just who we are but as we're mentoring our young airmen and space professionals that they under that we understand who they are and everybody learns a little bit differently but it's about learning consistently and constantly because that's reshaping who we are and how the air force is going to be moving forward so i think that's i'm pretty excited about digital university i know that we're in a pilot stage right now but it's really a new track and miss knossenberger's effort so i'm pretty excited about that also if you so i'm going to go back to that um, innovation thread one more time if you had the perfect environment if you could create the best innovative um box in the air force and it may not and i use the word box loosely because it's probably not a box but if you could make the best environment as a leader what would that environment be so that to maximize that innovative approach 
so that we are always that forward leaning organization. <laughs> I was thinking about this once um, when when one of our terrific partners and writers in the in the Beltway asked uh, me the question. She said, "What does an intelligence officer in 2030 look like?" And that and and maybe that was focused on intelligence, but I think it largely goes for any career field. I said, "I don't know," but the one thing I do know is that they should be the ones to decide to be provided the pivot space necessary to do with it what is required of them based on where we are at on the world stage, or perhaps what they know the place we need to go. And at some point in time, we have to recognize that. So it's the idea of the box. Is it a box or is it a box that you can move the outside edges to? So long as we can do that and we think about letting them young airmen i mean generation z is incredible i'm so inspired by the way in which they can assemble with one another the way in which they understand technology but the question at hand is a monumental one and these are monumental times i'll take it on a little bit of the vein of artificial intelligence but again this is a journey it's an end state not a thing and it's a multidisciplinary topic you can't talk about many technological topics right now without talking about evolution, language, learning, the basics of how a computer works, how your brain works. Um, so everyone has something to play in this game. And even from the technology perspective, sociologists, philosophers, everyone else, these are the future rock stars in the industry. And we have them all around us. We just need to unleash them. But while all the stuff we talk about here at Aphidic, all the technologies. The story remains to be seen in the months, years, and probably decades ahead. But what we should recognize is we're now at an inflection point in the history of the human race. What we do with our enterprises with respect to people and technology will impact our present, our future, and I'd argue our perhaps eventual destiny. The strengths of this free nation and democratically represent people are, and it always will be, our ability to work cooperatively together in order to preserve individual liberties, i.e. do as you want, see the world as you would like to see. So this is no time to disconnect with one another on the topic or be passive or distracted. And the story is beginning, but understanding and our airmen do understand this current technologies and their potential, both good and bad is essential. And I think caring is crucial. And one thing I've been so fortunate to learn from you and from many others is that our best leadership takes its cues from the needs of its ranks. And likewise, democracy takes its direction from the voice of its people. And no system is perfect, but it does give good standing for the fundamental purpose of ensuring their needs are heard and their rights are protected. But ideally those voices are informed and at least generally aware of the conflicts and potential compromises we might face. Effective leadership, effective movement forward, effective democracy depends on this. So in my mind, when we talk about enabling airmen, I think it's time for us to have another awakening a public awareness and a conscientious consensus that the choices we make now are important because they're going to set the path or that proverbial perhaps box in the future. So the idea is to build trust and experience with the concepts we're talking about, to empower people. Um, you know, leadership doesn't equal rank and rank doesn't equal experience any longer. We all started machine learning in any meaningful way in 2011. That's just the way that it's been. Granted, there's a long history of AI and like topics. But my concern is that I hope for those who one day look back upon these times, they shouldn't be left wishing our eyes had been more open on this topic to provide them an open space uh, to pivot and learn. So sort of fields of dream it, that would be the idea for the future, build it and they will come. Uh, much of what we're doing in DevSecOps and everything else, just unleash people with the tools and then observe those interactions and empower them. And I think we'll largely see that into existence one day. 
Mike, I want to pivot the conversation just a little bit because you have this unique experience right now where you're actually embedded with um, the academic community. And so I'd like to ask you to possibly share a little bit about your experience working in uh, what I consider a totally innovative cornerstone uh, capability of setting up the, this new Air Force MIT AI Accelerator Partnership. Can you share a little bit what you and your team are working on? Of course. Um, the first period of work at the Air Force MIT AI Accelerator began in earnest in January of 2020. It's pursuant to a cooperative agreement with MIT and MIT Lincoln Lab, and our efforts stretch across three main lines. The first is execute flagship AI projects. We currently have 12. And the related work to bridge the valley of death that we're always talking about, bringing technology to airmen, or as the vice chief says, uh, of this unit in particular, make AI real. The second is the development of scalable AI education. Much of our conversation today has been about, you do have a role to play. You do have the opportunity to learn it. So we have to learn and be lifelong learners moving forward. And the third, and what I view as the most critical aspect of this partnership, is leading the dialogue on AI ethics and safety. Now, all of this is in accordance with the executive order from the President on Artificial Intelligence, Section 256 of the 2020 NDAA, our DOD AI strategy, and the Air Force AI strategy. So we work together with MIT campus proper. So our airmen here and what makes us special is there are 10 airmen from nine different AFSCs at this unit, whether that's a pilot or an Intel officer or, or a cyber officer. And that stretches across the ranks of 04 to tech sergeants and staff sergeants. And it's that kind of thing that we put together this really representative room with totally different experiences that has made us successful for now. And then this, this incredible opportunity to be speaking with quite literally the world's leading voices and, 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 and professors and principal investigators on artificial intelligence. Or that's also with the undergrads and graduate students or postdocs. So there's about 100 of us working on these 12 pro flagship projects ranging from C-17 dynamic scheduling to weather operations and all the way to providing uh, scalable digital education with the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. And what I'm most inspired by on that topic is the fact that we are more alike than we are different. And by putting people in the same space, that's where we learn that, that we are more alike. The, the military isn't out there building killer robots. And that's crucial to talk about. It's okay to talk about that. We don't have the intent of doing that. But for things to be successful, a dialogue is necessary. And that's the really special thing about the accelerator itself. Um, one of the areas of expertise that's also in the accelerator that you didn't highlight, but I think it's really important for our constituencies today to know is that you actually have a legal intellectual property person sitting in that cell too. And I think that is a critical thought point that needs to go in from the very beginning of how do we make sure that the great work that we're doing is um, you, Department of the Air Force property that we can work on moving forward. And I know that is a definite conversation changer um, as we move forward. So. I look at that piece that it's really, um, it's a holistic approach from grassroots all the way forward, that it's really going to drive how we think about this all the way through the acquisition and operational process moving forward. A and shout out for Major Dave Jacobs. Absolutely. And he is the, and he is the only intellectual property attorney in, in the United States Air Force. So all that patent work on the Space Force, that's that's him from here over at the Accelerator as well. Yes, so um, thank you because I, I just think that's foundational as we move forward. People don't necessarily think about it, but um, the work in your group is really, it's a true 
you know, zero to velocity game moving forward. If you had one thing that you would tell today's um, future airmen or future space professional about your um, introduction to AI and machine learning and, and generating the velocity that has gotten you to where you are today, what do you have one or two um, tidbits or, or techniques, procedures that you would say, this was a decision point that it helped me get velocity or it helped me get started? I think the first is recognizing that there's not a single career, a single profession, a single place where a machine learning application couldn't make your life better or couldn't make an airman's life better. And that's important. Now, what we have concerns are, are this idea of Terminator, or perhaps the concerns that it will take my job. First off, AI doesn't do that. Automation does that. Totally, you know, it's a Venn diagram, but that's a different conversation to be had, and an important one as well. The first place I'm gonna point on, on the bureaucracy side is AI.mil. On AI.mil is the references and blogs and they discuss much of these things. Um, one of our great leaders at the Joint AI Center, uh, Greg Allen, produced a 20-page paper that says, these are the basics that we should expect our airmen, our soldiers, our sailors, our Marines to basically understand about AI. So when I use the word AI, it's different than machine learning and it's more precise, right? And deep learning is different than machine learning. How do we get to a point where that's the level of sophistication we have on the topic? Now, most of the time we're talking about AI and operations. We're changing JADC2. But that's hard. Those are unique one-off scenarios that aren't necessarily consistent. And furthermore, the underlying techniques that are being used, if you have a, an anomaly detection algorithm per se, detecting substance abuse at a pharmacy, that is quite literally the same technique and algorithm that would be used to sift through all the data in the intelligence community to find anomalous patterns of behavior. So we have to get to this point where we have that level of sophistication understanding on the topic. And most of the time, the place where AI is going to make the biggest bang for the buck, the thing that's going to make the biggest difference are in the finance offices, is in installation and energy at the dental clinic. So how do we all see that responsibility for us to learn about the topic? So AI.mil and those 20 pages, we should expect leaders to have those topics at least down pat, those to be able to communicate that way. Um, and then think about the room in which you sit in and just ask an airman. I promise there's a citizen coder or a citizen machine learning engineer in your office I mean, that's why we created this idea of the computer language initiative to tap latent talent, to tap the new generation. I think largely we wonder if the talent exists, but we don't look across the cubicle and ask. So, um, and the last point is the idea of that the federal government, the US Air Force in particular, will be ethically sound with the way that we use AI and responsible. That's on each of us at the end of the day. And um, it's a crucial conversation. And one, again, I think that it's not the engineers who should lead that conversation. It's the humanities as well. Thanks, Mike. I, um, I wish I had more time because I, I would like to hope that we can continue this conversation because I think that um, it's just the start um, recently we our offices partnered to run the first air force datathon and which i call hashtag built by airmen and space professionals which was a really awesome opportunity um, to bring in people from all across the board to really make data operational um focusing on a specific problem set we plan to do more of these and but today um I really appreciate you helping us begin the conversation because I think it needs to continue. So thank you and your team for what you're doing at the MIT AI Accelerator. Thank you for the work that you're doing and 
leading AI machine learning, um, I can't thank you enough because I like to say data is a team sport and uh, as well as learning as a team sport. And hopefully together we can um, work across the enterprise to uh, bring what I call chief data evangelist CDEs all across the board to um, help make um, machine learning and artificial intelligence and at, you know, at the speed and velocity that our air and space professionals need it immediately. So thank you for what you do, thank your team, and um, look forward to the next conversation. Thank you, ma'am, really appreciate it.